Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name's Will and I'm here with my colleague Ian from the NOC and we're going to show you some funny photos of uh, what we did to build the network here. So, um, what's the network actually for? Here is our vision, our strategic goals and all that blah. Um, we wanted to give everyone gigabit, really, these days. Um, some decent Wi-Fi, which has worked pretty well. Um, and also, uh, in, in line with our aims of having basically properly provision enhanced connectivity, filter-free, net neutrality, all those things you hear in the papers these days. And we wanted to have a lot of fun while doing it and maybe top our tans up. <laughs> so how do we design this? Well, we have uh, an intersection team which goes and does various hacker camps. So um, it means we kind of run different size networks every year almost these days. Um, so, but this is the biggest one ever, obviously. Um, we had 37 Darden Close, um, which is uh, maybe 15 more than the, the previous time we've, we've done an event. Um, 47 fiber cables laid across the fields, um, totaling 7.2 kilometers. Um, 78 edge switches. <laughs> and, and just over 100 uh, wireless access points. We decided to run a, a collapsed core for this uh, uh, event to reduce uh, interdependencies, so everything, as much as possible, goes back to a central location. So, this site you see all around us, I mean, it has a, a great industrial history. Um, that means there's actually damn train tracks everywhere, and unknown underground services, and, and one of the problems we came up with, appeared during uh, uh, our planning for this event, is that um, we weren't able to without lots of special measures to really uh, go very deep into the soil um, because there's unknown cables and there are really quite a lot of train tracks as well which make running, running uh, cables different, difficult. So we didn't do this. Uh, we did, however, manage to do this during the build-up. Um, uh, fibers do not generally survive being run over by a train, um, and this one is kind of broken. Um, <laughs> it, this was due to a, an accident, basically. Uh, um, anyway, uh, no harm done there. So this actually all required quite a lot of planning, and we did this in a lot more depth than, uh, than previously. Um, we teamed up with the VOC for planning in OpenStreetMap. Um, we, we then were able to do a lot of automation of the cable selection um, and putting the right cables in the right places using OpenStreetMap API and some tools we built ourselves. Um, and a side effect of having all that information available is that it was then publicly available to you guys. So you can see where the Darden clothes are if you look at the um, camp map URL. And, uh, and it enables us to check the design properly. Uh, and, and generally sort of make sure that we don't spend ages pulling a cable to find it's five meters too short, um, which is really super frustrating. Um, here's here's a, a plan ex extracted from that of, of, of the site. Um, you probably won't be able to see it because the site is quite large, and <laughs> uh, but you can check this online. Uh, but you can see our, our main cable routes uh, across the site here, uh, which are the, the green lines. Uh, and uh, really, really, we wanted to get to everywhere that you guys occupied. Um, and here is another diagram you won't be able to see, um, <laughs> which is uh, our, our physical infrastructure. And um, what, we, what we actually do is have a lot of multi-core fiber cables um, where, uh, which are connected together. And what this means is, is that basically we have light paths all the way from, say, an edge dot and claw all the way over there back to the NOC data center. Um, it means that if there's any for instance, problems with power or similar in, in a, or equipment in a, in a more peripheral location, then uh, that won't affect, it won't have as large an impact and, and then therefore makes the network more reliable for you guys. Uplink, well, we had to get the internet here. Um, we, uh, we spent some time on this because as, as those of you who have traveled here, you know that um, this, this place is quite remote. Um, there's not a great deal of infrastructure, but then we found actually about two kilometers that way, um, there is a, a large high voltage line, and um, using our contacts, um, we were able to uh, uh, get those guys to give us a 10 gig wave back to Berlin. 
um, which is great. And, and is, to those of you who have seen our presentations about Congress networks, meant we could do much the same thing. Uh, so yeah, there's a, there's a splice enclosure on a pylon. This is it, uh, about two kilometers from the site. But it wasn't all that simple um, because there's a river there. There's also a lake the other side. Um, so we would have to carry the fiber quite a long way. Um, so we used a lot of this uh, lightweight fiber, um, which uh, actually uh, two kilometers of this only weighs 20 kilos, so you can actually pick it up and carry it around. So we had to cross the lake. Um, <laughs> Our experiment showed that uh, the canoe, the two-man canoe, was actually better for unrolling the fiber than the rubber boat um, because uh, you could just put the stake through the spindle and unwind it. Um, so yeah, can canoes seem pretty good for that purpose. Uh, so yeah, we had an interesting time. I, I can't actually use a canoe, um, so yeah, it took some time. We, of course, yeah, here is the fiber in the canoe. Um, <laughs> and we had to do, obviously, some splicing out in the field, so there's quite a lot of sitting, getting stung by insects and all that kind of stuff. A lot of you know about the rodent damage. In fact, I have the, some of the offending pieces of fiber here if anyone wants to come and have a look at them. Uh, and uh, this obviously had, this had quite some uh, coverage and lots of people found this quite uh, amusing. Um, what we actually did to, to mitigate this was um, uh, we went along in this stretch where these animals live and we've basically invaded and uh, hung the fiber up higher in the trees so um, we weren't really obstructing where they go. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty easy with this thin fiber for it to be damaged uh, by, by rodent activity. So back to technical stuff, uh, layer three design. Um, BGP Edge with a pair of Juniper MX-104s in, in Berlin and, and here in, in now Noc DC in the Ezekiel Park. Um, and then we, we uh, dusted off a, a very venerable um, Force 10 E600 that I think was last used at 29C3? 28C3. Um, but did a good job there and um, actually was just what we needed here, so why not? Um, we did the usual, get the, we used a CCC address space for IPv4 and uh, then a temporary slash 16 from the ripe NCC. And of course, V6. It's pretty much the same as last time. <laughs> uh, just a few photos from the NOC DC. We actually even managed to label stuff this time. <laughs> Um, edge. So um, we, we rented a lot of HP ProCurve um, 2530 uh, with 24 gig ports on the front um, and then upload link those into the core with 2 times one gig E. These are single fiber optics so they use two different wavelengths on the same fiber and that reduces the amount of fiber that we need to pull around the fields and also makes troubleshooting easier. Uh, for some locations we wanted to provide 10 gig E uplinks so we used some Juniper switches there. And we were testing some other hardware as well, uh, Cumulus Gigabit PoE switch uh, with 10 gig uplinks and some Huawei switches as well. So um, we, we actually, although the bulk of the equipment was the Pro Curves, um, we, we have been using some other stuff as well. Data center, it's often a pain doing this. It's been damned hot here, as, as many of you know, and, and really it's been that way for the past few weeks. Um, so we have a, a DC container with a NOC and, and Vox services and, and the uplink actually terminates in there. Um, we had lots and lots of aircon problems. Um, in fact, we started off with two aircon units and we ended up with seven, um, which is more than the number of switches we had in the place. Um, <laughs> but yeah, at least, at least it uh, started, uh, started, stayed cool there. I'll move over to Ion for the Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi, um, we've been using a similar setup as uh, at this uh, last Congress, which was a uh, dual Aruba controller running in a high availability setup. Um, we've deployed over uh, 101 8211N and 8211AC uh, access points, uh, and that had an average of about 1.5 uh, access point per Datenclo, so we would mount one access point in Datenclo, and then we have another 
like a more out, outdoor suited IP65 access point which in the neighborhood to uh, cover, cover the edges. Uh, because what we see is that we around the dot and Clo, we have around 30 meters of good coverage, and then we still need to fill in the other gaps. Uh, so we used uh, a couple of outdoor access points. Uh, so you might have seen them um, uh, hanging around uh, at several places, which are, these are the access points which look a little bit like security cameras, the uh, big white dome access points. Um, uh, and we are uh, deploying multiple access points in, a, in, in the track tent and workshop tents like this to uh, have more capacity because we, there, um, in a room like this, there's like, what is it, 500 people there, so uh, one access point doesn't cut it, so you would need multiple access points to have enough capacity. Um, so we had a peak of uh, 3,300 associated clients, and we did around uh, 1.25 gigabits, that's RX and TX uh, aggregated. Uh, we've seen around uh, 10,000 unique devices, so that's, so that's, not, that's, that's what we've seen over the last couple of days, and uh, that's not concurrently online in the network. So, um, yeah, we were running, uh, like at Congress, 8201X again. So people could use a random username password to log into the network. And uh, so on the left side, we have a nice top 11 there. And then you can see why we made it the top 11. So. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, um, yeah. The device types on the network uh, it's, it's it's mostly smartphones. So you can see that Android and iOS are uh, on, in the top three. So uh, uh, that's that's a large bit of the network are, are all smartphones. Um, and then other than that, we have of course Linux devices. And then, uh, as we would expect at CCC, that this Windows is being very very low used. So that's good. <laughs> Um, so, um, regarding the uh, type of devices that connected to the network, so we, um, uh, more than 50% were actually 5 gigahertz capable, so that's pretty good. Uh, last Congress we did, I think, around 65%, but, uh, uh, but yeah, it's good that we have more than 50% of devices actually being 5 gigahertz capable. And we're also seeing quite a lot of, uh, of the newer generation devices, the 8211AC devices, that's already 21%. Um, and regarding the uses of the SSIDs, um, uh, yeah, about 42% uh, of the devices were on 8211X, that's a bit less than at last Congress, but um, still pretty okay. Uh, so if you wanna have some encryption on, on the Wi-Fi layer, then yeah, use 8211X. <laughs> Um, yeah, more pretty graphs. Uh, so this is a graph where we uh, are uh, plotting the uh, number of associations uh, per, per field or per region, and you can see, I'm not sure if the mouse pointer works, but uh, you can see over here that the green lines, uh, this, this peaks over here are actually the people getting in and out of the, the, the track tents, so we can, we can pretty much see that w which, uh, yeah, if there's a good talk going on in the tent, so if there's lots of people there, then it must be good. <laughs> and then at some point, uh, like during the night, we see people going to the, to the east side of the camp, which is where the bear village is, so people are going to the bars and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you see the, the red line over here, that's, that's, the, that's the, the, cent the central plots uh, where also the bars are, so it's, so it's, well, pretty obvious where people are going. <laughs> Um, so the lightning storm yesterday. Yeah, so we obviously have a lot of stuff missing here that we, because we had to uh, power down the DC, we, all the generators actually got turned off. Um, but we, uh, it's also interesting to see that the people were like uh, moving to the they were getting into the big track tents. Uh, that's the blue line over here, and then people were moving to the to the central plots. That's the red line over here. So it's also interesting to see what's happening <laughs> when you are uh, having a situation like that. Um, so challenges. Um, yeah, we had to make a, a bit of a trade-off between um, uh, coverage, capacity, and performance because it's a, it's a very open field. So it's 
um, and there's not a lot of attenuation, so you don't have so you, there's a quite large chance that access points will end up on the same channel. So you we we don't want to mount the access points too high, and but then if we mount them more lower, that could actually mean that we have less coverage. So that that we need to make those trade-offs to to get something uh, something working and. Um, and we did end up having uh, quite a lot of uh, high channel utilization in some areas. So that's actually um, the um, amount of time that the radio in access point is busy um, receiving and sending traffic. And once that channel gets more and more loaded, it will just slow down. And at some point it will could possibly break that you will not get even get an association anymore. So we had some radios that were um, averaging around 65% channel utilization, which is very, very high and peaking at 95%. <laughs> um, another, uh, another issue we, are, we were facing is that we, there were a lot of rogue access points around and that caused some devices to have some roaming issues because there are, uh, the device will receive so much BSSIDs. If you're, for example, in the central plots, you can see very, very much BSSIDs around you and your Wi-Fi device at some point will have some issues selecting the correct network because it's receiving so many beacons and so many probe responses. So in the future, we would like to um, use some more uh, performance monitoring using uh, Wi-Fi probes. So we're looking into a solution uh, for that so we can uh, test the performance of the Wi-Fi network uh, just independently of the Wi-Fi infrastructure itself. So we will have another, a couple of nodes connected to the network which are doing periodic speed tests and latency tests to, so we can better signal where at which areas the Wi-Fi would be bad. So. Uh, another problem we were facing is that the uh, space blankets that were put around the data enclosure actually caused a drop in 20 dB of signal attenuation. So that was very, very significant. <laughs> uh, so we, at some point we had to remove the space blankets again to, uh, to increase the signal on the field. Yeah, and here's another a graph that actually shows the five most uh, busy uh, um, access points uh, with the channel utilization in five gigahertz. So you can see that there are access points that are peaking up to 90% channel uh, utilization, even in five gigahertz band. And that's worth near uh, uh, DK Utrecht, Hamburg, and well, one of the access points in this, uh, this uh, track as well. Uh, oh, we had another tweet today, which was pretty funny. Um, so, <laughs> Somebody, somebody's geolocation was a bit fucked up, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, this was because the, most of the access points here, they've been uh, used at a conference. Uh, it was actually a hack in the box in Burs van Bellag, Amsterdam. So that's the reason why um, yeah, he was, his location showed up as uh, Burs van Bellag, Damrak, and there's some sex shops around here. <laughs> so you want to take this one? Yeah. Okay. So um, we didn't actually produce any, I don't think we produced any use more bandwidth signs this uh, time around. Um, uh, the uplink did get used quite well, um, peaking at 7.5 gigs out. Um, so we're pretty happy with this. Um, next time around, I guess we'll need more, because we always need more. Um, We, we also did some instrumentation of, of what happened inside the camp and uh, saw like a maximum backplane capacity on the E600 of 22.5 gigabits. So um, there's some traffic, quite some traffic flowing around the site as well, which is, is nice. Um, we did a, a new um, dashboard, which you can look at. Um, and we we're always eager to add more stats to that. We added some temperature sensors from the ICMP village and some other stuff. So um, yeah, more, more to come there. And uh, I mean, it, it just shows... Uh, uh, here I've got a screenshot. Um, it's yeah, number of wireless users and, and you know speed and uh, traffic used by uh, used by the visitors. All, all very shiny stuff actually. Um, ticketing. Uh, we used OTRS for the pre-event, which is kind of a historical thing. And then for years we've always used Roundup on site because it's just really simple and and like people can just get started straight away with this. We only had uh, 51 tickets. Um, we come through, which is quite low, I think, actually. So, thanks very much to the Knock Help Desk for um, fielding the the end user queries and doing all the unplugging and stuff. Um, 
you may notice we had some some lights on the Darden Clo. Um, uh, these were originally from the Omen 2013 event, but they're actually very useful for us to um, diagnose any network problems. Um, <laughs> so they had this interesting kind of thread. <laughs> Oh yeah, so somebody at uh, DK Dublin was complaining uh, that uh, the lights on the uh, LED li LED poles on the Datenclo were too bright, and uh, yeah, they asked it to be switched off, and we were like, well, um, <laughs> at least our our Belgian colleague here said that um, yeah, stars are down, team has been dispatched, ETA ten light years, so. <laughs> Um, so what, what's the team actually behind this? Well, it's actually quite a lot of people. Um, um, like it's more than 30 people in, in seven sub-teams. Um, of, of some of them quite young and some of them rather old gits like me. Um, uh, and, and we really started on site uh, two weeks ago and one day today. So I actually arrived here two weeks ago um, to, to start with the uplink stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, as, as I said before, the, the info help desk were dealing with a lot of our end users, end user queries and, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, actually, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the equipment and services we use for this event can't really be bought commercially. Um, either it costs quite a lot of money, the, the commercial rates, or it's, it's short term, uh, stuff, or you need to borrow equipment and, and people just don't lend this stuff out. So we actually really rely on a lot of people who, who give us stuff for free. Um, and um, so, yeah, really, really thanks to um, our Arblinks, uh, KPN Strato and SIS11, um, Ediscom who, who supplied the 10 gigi wave to um, Berlin, Ekix and Speedbone for, for housing of the, the Berlin side of the operation. Uh, and then uh, quite a lot of hardware from Bibio, Cumulus, SecureLink, Aruba, and Flex Optics. So, so really, really thanks to those guys um, for, for giving us quite a lot of equipment and yes we will send it back <laughs> so well uh, goodbye um, the network in the camping fields will be torn down starting uh, about 1900 today after the closing presentation um, we will have everything kind of gone by 10am uh, on Tuesday uh, so um, please be kind to our fibers as you see them in the fields because we want to roll them up and use them at the next event. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I get to do this, yeah. Uh, so, so I probably have time for a couple of questions. If anyone has some, uh, come up to the mic. Is, it, is there a mic? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, it's the mics here and here. I can't see anything up here. First up on the on my left. Um, you, you mentioned that you got the fiber to the electricity pole, mm. um, but was the fiber to Berlin already included on the network, or did you need to add it? Uh? Actually, actually, there's a electricity substation um, at really near Zedenik, just down there. So the end-to-end, uh, -end, like the actual photons, as it were, go as far as, as Zadenik and go into their DWDM equipment there. So the, the actual, you know, physical splice through piece of fiber is about six kilometers um, to, to, um, to camp, and then it is, is transponded there. It's, it's too far, really, to light. As well. So it's not a physical pair of fibers all the way to Berlin. It goes into an optical network, which is pretty standard, really. See any more pr questions? No, then thanks very much. I'll pass over to the VOC. I don't know how to use uh, such a device with an apple on it. <laughs> <laughs> if it had a penguin, <laughs> I might be able to get it running. Yeah, that looks pretty nice. So, 
it's really, really cool to see that tent filled with people wanting to see what we build and how we build it. Oh, it's, it's running automatically. Interesting. Oh, you just, yeah. And maybe you can pause it. Thank you. So it's nice to see the tent being filled with people like that. But as you may know, there are a lot of people on the campsite tearing down their villages or already on the, their way home, or some may even not have been able to come here in the first place. And we want the great experience you have here at least a little bit shared with them. So we are the WOC and we are providing recording and streaming for the lecture halls and a little bit for the music on the field. And um, you may have seen our small and uh, larger cats standing all around here. Um, so the walk here is not alone. We don't have enough hardware to do an event great as this or like the Congress. And we always have helpers. And this year we had like the AGS and a guy from iSystems here who provided hardware and also a lot of support and they both of them run one of the big tents and um, we really like to say thank you to them because without them that would not have been possible at all. <laughs> so as you might have heard uh, the action is intense here on the camp and tents are a, bit, a little bit more complicated than like a full, full operational congress center. So um, the day we arrived here and tried to build our stuff up, we, we had like a tent with no walls and no floor in it. And uh, so guys from us started climbing around and hanging all the screens there and the beamers and um, Actually, you may have noticed that the tents stayed like in the skeleton state for quite a bit of time, and that was not really planned like that. So the, between uh, the, the build-up team of the tents finishing the tents and we are setting up the audio video equipment, there was like 0 0.125 days, so only some hours, and it was really, really hard to get it all done up until the opening event, but we managed to do it, and it was really hard for the team. So in the end, give the team who's not here on the stage a really big applause because they really, really worked hard to get that, make, to get that done. <laughs> so we have three main stages here. We have the both tents, north and south, and yeah, their names are a bit complicated. They switched places sometimes and also got new names, so... There was a little bit of confusion there, but in the end we managed to make it. And we also had the bear stage in the, in the Berlin village, uh, which did a really interesting program. And those were the three main stages we, we were working on. And um, additionally, we had our container, one of the OC's container, the knock had uh, one similar, you can see it on the screen. But the POC did it right, and they, they had like a big tent and a lot of space to party. So next year, we will try to learn from, no, in four years, we will try to learn from the POC. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of hardware there, but the main device is standing in the DC. So what we have in our container is those really nice tele lights. They don't only show the time, but whenever something happens, like a talk starts or a talk finishes or one of our encoder processes stop working, they will blink and display a message what's happening and they are, they are used via uh, over the air so we can carry them to the different locations we are going and always be, always be notified. And also we have this really nice blinking li light uh, underneath it, which... Uh, actually makes a sound when it's turning because it's that crappy, but you can hear <laughs> when, when something goes wrong, which is also really good. So what we have in the DC are two new devices that we bought in the beginning of the year. We, we call them the Minions because they're really small. They're like 10 centimeters wide, but they're really, really powerful the cores. They have like four 3.9 gigahertz i7 cores, and they did the whole encoding for the master HD files for the whole campsite. And at least half of the talks they did even twice because we missed something. 
and they, those are the two devices who are actually producing the files you are downloading and viewing in the browser, at least the most of them. And these are really, really nice devices and I can, yeah, I really like them because they're so small, you can carry them around with you, no problems. We also have uh, in light, a, a bit of interesting gear standing um, beneath the ceiling of one of the buildings in this direction, the one with the, with the high chimney. We have Roden Schwartz transmitter equipment for FM radio and DVB-T and DVB-T2, I think. And these are really interesting devices and we have played quite a lot with them. Um, actually, you might be a, a, even, you, you were even able to listen to the talks going on here and the special radio while you were driving around Sydney and doing your, your buyings for, for your village. And the DVBT also had la, a lot of special features like we had EPG running after some, some time and even managed to get, uh, oh, is there a slide missing? Oh, I think there's a slide missing. We had uh, even teletext working and like a Twitter feed on teletext and this. <laughs> but we, we weren't able to finish that uh, as fine as we wanted to. Like we wanted you to be able to enter your own teletext sites and uh, send them out via, via DVBT and we are really looking forward to get that working at the next Congress, so everyone can have their own teletext website then. <laughs> so another thing, like uh, FM transmission is pretty old, and we like the new stuff, so we, we had guys from the Open Digital Radio Project bringing DAB Plus transmitters there, and they also managed to stream slideshow versions of the video via DAB Plus, there are not many, not that many radios out there that can receive that, but they brought us one and it seems it actually worked pretty well. So maybe it's really the future. I think, maybe, ish. <laughs> so yeah, there were some special projects we have been working on, like um, when the thunderstorm was announced, the third asked us if we can do a video explaining to the nerds how to secure their tent. And um, as you may have seen, there were some tents that were really in need of a little help there. And the thing is, we used that video, we reproduced it, and cut it, and then we uploaded it to our storage, like we have a, a mirror of video files on the campsite and uh, went away and when we came back and looked at our, at our graphs, they kind of looked like this. <laughs> and what you see there is like 1.2 terabytes of traffic produced by this single file. <laughs> and we were like, like limiting out our one GE link. No, uh, it's, it's actually, yeah, it, it was peaking like around 1.2 Gig, uh, gig bits per second for an hour or two hours because everyone on the cam set was viewing that one video and um, looking at the connection stats, we saw like 50,000 people watching that. It's, it's like crazy. And we're, we were not really sure it might have been a software bug of someone's notebook downloading the file over and over again, but even then the numbers are pretty awesome. <laughs> so... As I'm talking about the stats, we also have a nice dashboard, and it's actually the same technology as you have, but ours is not public, I think. And um, as you can see in the top row, we peaked like at two gigabits per second with the streaming, so that's all streaming relays added up. The one on the cam set, we have a local relay here, as well as the ones in the internet. And that's actually not that much. Like on the Congress, we were like around 17 gigabits. But hey, okay, it's about the sunshine and camping, and yeah, I know you're likely not to watch the streams, but there were great talks, so maybe you should take a look at the recordings then. Um, we, we picked like around 600 viewers at all stages, but the, the biggest stage was actually the beer stage with about 400 viewers watching a podcast there, and it was more than the peak at the tent, so yeah, actually it seems to be the bear stage was more interesting. <laughs> a 
looking at the stats, we had like two relays on the internet and one here on the campsite. And we did split routing and split, uh, split, uh, split systems so that people watching on the campsite got their traffic from the relays here and people, people watching from the internet got their traffic from there. Um, this year, we, we used HTTP all to the way down, so all streams were delivered via HTTP, and this enabled us to enable TLS and uh, deliver at least the option for everybody to watch the streams via an encrypted connection because encrypt everything would be the right thing I do to do. And this also meant that we didn't need to use Flash anymore, so we totally scratched that. And because we, we know the hamsters around here, <laughs> we decided to do every, everything really required to run our system on the site. So we do all transcoding and all release encoding on the site, and it turned out to be a good idea. And um, yeah, this was a little different to what we did at Congress. So it was a new thing for us too, to do everything here. Yeah, we tried to do multicast. Well, we plan to try to do it, but um, actually the problem is that with multicast, you're, you're sending out every packet once, and if the, the, the device didn't receive it properly, then, well, it's gone. So we need some kind of forward error correction on our streams inside the video stream, for example. And we have the code to do that because we're using that on DVB-T2, but at it seems there is no device and no no program out there able to play that back. So like VLC doesn't do it and, and FFmpeg doesn't do it. So if you're working on a media player and uh, want to help implementing forward error correction in the player, so next year we can use uh, multicast, then please talk with us. We would really like some help there. But it isn't actually necessary on the campsite because we had DVB-T here, and, but at the Congress it might be interesting there. And I think the, the, the NOC would like to see some, some multicast traffic too, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Multicast. Multicast. So yeah, we announced like a YOLO stream, so everyone on the campsite that has anything that makes any kind of noise or sound or music or the like would be able to, uh, to share that with the internet, but more... We didn't really get to implementing it, but we will try to do that on the Congress, so be prepared. If you have anything that makes any kind of sound or music or want to share any anything, be prepared to stream something to an IceCast gateway on the Congress. We will have a gateway there for you, so, you re, uh, so everyone on the internet and on the Congress can listen to what you're producing. Um, yeah, and that's that's all from the... oh. There's a screen from the teletext, actually. <laughs> so that's all we have to say, and say thank you to the cats, and thank you to all the people. And before you're leaving, we have our local mirror with all recordings of all talks here, and it's connected via 10GE to the Dutton Close, so you can start your AirSync now and take all the recordings with you. And yeah, see you soon.
Yeah. So I should talk to you about the power here at the camp. Um, it was quite a tricky task to do it here. Um, we have started way before the start point set here in March and talked to the big net company here, Eon Edis. Uh, if, if it is possible to um, yeah, place some transformators outside, uh, but the capacity of the lines here are all yeah, not working for us. So uh, you can use it as a museum, but uh, you cannot get any more power. So we started here on the site on the 31st and uh, get to deliver our material and uh, build the backstage. And uh, yeah, we've installed a total like 30 kilometers of cables, 200 224 power distribution boxes, that's only the CE connector ones. So we have about 500 uh, normal connector boxes outside uh, at the whole campsite to deliver you all the power you needed. Um, we've planned with many more power than it's really used. That's the plan of the whole campsite. It was also in the public wiki. Um, and uh, the company that does the sanitary installation here told us they they alone would use uh, about 400 kilowatt of power all time. I don't see it, but I think all the showers would be cold, but I don't know it. Uh, total, we had here seven generators, five connection box, uh, boxes, uh, which we have, um, yeah, get the, and instead of a museum's building, there was our connection box. And uh, yeah, it, it, I think it worked fine, the network, uh, the, the power network. Um, we don't have much problems. We had one generator failure in this morning at the uh, shower spot uh, and the disco. And uh, we had one, uh, yeah, like uh, burning box. Uh, there's some burning RCD in it. Uh, it was on, I think, day minus one. And we had uh, a defective power line on day three. So I will come to the statistic later because this computer doesn't have any internet. Um, we had a nice uh, graphics. Uh, we'll see it later from the POC. So thanks for the POC for doing it. And we had a whole bunch of angels that helped us here uh, going around, uh, seeing if the cables are not too hot and uh, clicking the RCD back in if you have tried to uh, get it out. And we had a lot of rainproof installation. I don't have to think about so much uh, since the thunderstorm, since we take out all generators and plugging them back in and yeah, mainly all things are working. So some some light installation doesn't work, uh, but uh, yeah, that's normal. But the, the whole rest was working fine. So we could. So do we get an image? Yeah. So that's the portal of the, the, the podcast built for us. Uh, you see their live screen of all uh, powers that's used from the generators. So I think this one is right out right now, but uh, the rest is, is live data. And uh, you also have... Uh, Also, the, the, the live statistics. So, yeah, yeah, my wonder. Yeah. So, I had one one big generator uh, standing at the NOCTC uh, that was able to. Um, yeah, switch on another generator if we have a power, fa power failure. But I think we don't have any failures uh, at the NOCTC, only the big one at the thunderstorm. <laughs> and also the tents, I don't hear any failures about it. So um, in, in total, everything works fine. And if it just will work.
Yeah, we had. Uh, I, I would like to show you the whole um, power consumption of the network, but uh, be because of the big power failure today and the generator doesn't work, uh, I cannot prepare it, so I don't think I will find it. Um, you can talk to the POCs, they should have it. And yeah, that was it from my side, so I hope it has worked for you and you don't have um, so much power failures, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can ask them. Hi. Hey. Hi. Einen schönen guten Tag. Dzień dobry. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, mam jedno pytanie. Dlaczego tam jest taki uh, kot? Why is the cat standing there? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's an interesting question. Um, some time ago, the Vox started, when the, when the Vox started to record lectures, we had all the things set up, all cameras running, all streams running, everything looked fine, and the hall was empty. So we said, okay, everything's fine, we can go and relax. But then the hall started to fill, and people were standing on the stages, and someone asked, well, why is the stage still empty on the stream? And the thing is that, that uh, the system in between has failed in a way that it repeated the same frame over and over again and we didn't notice until the talk started. So we decided we, we, we would have something or somebody on the stage who is moving constantly. But we wouldn't get an angel for that dancing all the day on the stage. So we decided to get some cats that are moving all the time. And this is our test if our stream and our setup is working. Because if they, if they don't move, either the battery is empty or the stream is dead. But actually, we're really liking them, so, that they're, so they're, they're traveling with us to every event and we really are caring for them. And yeah. we, have, we also have a big one at the, at the cube in the office, the mother of the small ones in the tents, maybe. Uh, I am interested in the reasoning uh, about uh, middle voltage transformers versus generators. And was it no option to install uh, transformers and connect to the global grid? And the, well, first this. Uh, yes, it, it, it would be possible. Uh, we have, like the Nox said, uh, there was a tran big transformer station near Selenik, uh, but it would have cost us more money uh, than we had. And uh, it would only be profitable if we do it the whole camp for about one or one and a half months, then it would be okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and just another question, uh, why were the, uh, the showers electrically heated instead of burnt fuel? So was it yeah, I would really like to say you why, but I don't know it. Uh, I, I was getting a, a white a piece of paper and there's an end, so 401.1 uh, kV for the whole shower installation. And I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> Um, do you know how much fuel was consumed by the generators? How many liters of diesel did the camp need? I think it should be, uh, we have tanked uh, the last bit today uh, and it is about uh, 30,000. Okay, thanks. Um, how much percentage of the installed capacity was actually utilized by the camp? Uh, could you repeat it? it was well, you said you have a lot of lots of generators, and you had too much power for uh, that. We didn't use enough power, so how little did we use? So um, we had here on the camp. We have uh, calculated with uh, 200 watt per person. That would be about by 4,500 visitors, about uh, 0.9 megawatt, and we had the 400 kV for the uh, installation of the sanitaries. And we had the light and other things, so we planned with about uh, 1.8 to 2.5 uh, megawatt. And uh, we are using right now, I think about, uh, in the highest peak, it was about 500 kilowatt.
Um, bei der Net Frequency only 44 Hertz instead of 50. Uh, that's the whole camp. So it is possible that some generators are a little bit lower and some are a little, little bit higher. So we had to check all uh, generators and it's calculated. I don't know uh, where's the bug. <laughs> so here we have 49.98 and. Uh, Wasn't that the broken one? Is the broken one not hertz? <laughs> ah, it's possible that the broken one is not uh, yeah, connected right now. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, I don't see anyone from the WOC, from the Water Operations Center. Um, can you, any of you give us any stats on water consumptions or supplies or whatever? Maybe they're any still idea? drinking. Right. <laughs> they're drinking the black water, right? <laughs> I think that yesterday the water was empty and we had to get new one, or it was before two days. So uh, we've used really much water. Uh, first, thanks of all, everything worked, uh, worked perfectly as intended. Big up, really cool. I would be interested about the costs, actually. I'm not sure if you are allowed to talk about it, but I don't want to see numbers. I just want to know, POC, this uh, one-third of the whole budget, VOC, one, you know, just the technical costs. But maybe it's a secret. You can talk to us. I can talk about this from the NOC point of view. Um, and as we already mentioned, actually, we get a lot of stuff for free um, from, from people or there's not really a market to buy the thing we need. So um, so actually most of our expenditure is, is on really um, like ancillaries, you know, how many cable ties and, and this kind of stuff we have. And on all, all, of, all of our work is done by volunteers just like, just like other teams. So... Um, It, 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 it turns out that it's not that expensive for a network point of view. Well, like uh, you saw the minions, the small boxes we have to encode the video, and we, we, we have those new since the last Congress, but they are not only for the camp here. So we will use them at a lot of the small conferences of the CCC and also assorted conferences and meetups all the way down. So, um, Even if they count, for maybe I don't know really how how, it's, how how from from rich budget they are calculated. But even if they count to here, they are not gone at the end of at the end of the camp. So we will use them for the next years to to do what we what we're doing um, without any charge to small conferences. Yeah. At my point, I cannot say, I, I don't know the whole budget here, so uh, I think it's really a big, big part of the whole budget for the electrical installation. Uh, because it's so much, it's uh, the, the diesel or Heizöl that we are using here, it's the generators, um, but you need it because you don't know uh, how many people you will get. Um, some villages said they need uh, 63 amps only for them, they don't use it right now. Uh, so I think it's quite a big part, but, uh, yeah. Are there any more questions? Well, oh. then give a warm applause to all the people working here, all the angels helping out. So uh, a really, really big thank you for all the figures, all the interesting stuff and interesting information. This is this for the infrastructure, infrastructure Refuge. And so uh, please also a really big round of applause for Will, I, and Mastermind, and Fengel.